I'm Mike Brown, author, nerd, and host of the Dark Patine podcast. Join me and Morgan Knudsen, author, paranormal researcher, and host of the TV shows Paranormal 911 and Haunted Hospitals, as we take you on a journey for the curious about the unseen, the mysterious, and the incredible things happening in the world about us. Welcome to Supernatural Circumstances. In late 2006, a self-help book and companion film took the world by storm. It was called The Secret. Written by author Rhonda Byrne, thanks in large part to an appearance on The Oprah Winfrey Show and endorsement from Oprah herself, the book at last count has sold roughly 30 million copies worldwide and has been translated into 50 languages. I admit I am one of those 30 million purchases and bought both the book and the film. I am here to report that I have been unable to manifest either a Lamborghini or a mansion by the ocean. I'm fairly certain that was the result for many others. And the book has thus fallen out of favor with former adherents, often to the point of ridicule. Does that mean that the ideas presented within are 100% wishful thinking on the part of people hoping to make for themselves and their families better lives? No, I don't think so, nor do I think Rhonda Byrne is a fraud or in any way malicious. Oprah Winfrey still swears by the power of the mind in her creative and business successes, as do many others. The idea is that our minds, both conscious and subconscious, have a direct effect on our environment and our success or lack thereof. The secret of creative manifestation has been around for a long time. Byrne's book was inspired in part by Wallace Waddle's 1910 book, The Science of Getting Rich. The idea, it is said, comes from the most controversial of ancient sources. That's right, the Bible. In Matthew 21, 22, it is written, All things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. Now that's a darn hot potato that I am not willing to hang on to. So if you want to get into that debate, you go right ahead. Theosophist Madame Blavatsky, Neville Goddard, Norman Vincent Peale, Robert Collier, Napoleon Hill, Esther Hicks, the sleeping prophet Edgar Cayce, and many, many more have said with resounding agreement that the root ideas presented in a book like Burns work. I cannot believe that all of these people were outright charlatans looking to fleece the masses. Many of those people, although again controversial, have done a lot of good for humanity. There has to be something other than simple greed that resonates with people that this idea keeps popping up. I can attest to examples of it in my own life, not the least of which is how I became a full-time podcast host. In the months after I had started Dark Poutine, I remarked to someone close to me how nice it would be if a big bag of money fell from the sky, giving me the chance to invest and pursue my passion as a vocation. Within a couple of months of expressing that, I got an email from the corporation I was then working for. They gave me and others in my particular management group two options, stay and grow with the company or take a voluntary payout and go on my way. Needless to say, I took the money. Sure, it was a risk and I was taking a chance at turning away from the sure thing, but I remembered my dream and took the leap and I haven't looked back. I hadn't been in that management position long, and in the one I had just left, I would not have seen the same offer. How I came into the position is another amazing story that also makes me think that it was the universe setting me up for the success I sincerely asked for. As I have said, there are many, many other examples before and since that time, so I believe that there is something to it, and belief, it would appear, has more to do with life successes and failures than we are often willing to admit. In this episode, you'll hear Morgan first talk about psychokinesis, also called telekinesis. Psychokinesis in the world of parapsychology is the action of the mind on matter, in which objects are supposedly caused to move or change as a result of mental concentration upon them. The physical nature of psychokinetic effects contrast with the cognitive quality of extrasensory perception, ESP, the other major grouping of parapsychological phenomena. 
the idea of psychokinesis goes far beyond Yuri Geller's spoon bending and into the quantum. Although scientific evidence supporting the existence of psychokinesis is lacking, according to Encyclopedia Britannica, some experiments have focused on the ability of subjects to influence outcomes of random number generators. Some researchers have interpreted the results of such experiments as revealing the existence of very small effects in which consciousness influences outcomes in such physical systems. Other studies, however, indicate that such conclusions are the result of various forms of bias, including publication bias and confirmation bias. Hence, experimental results, as with other parapsychological phenomena, have been inconclusive. Perhaps once again, it is the belief that is at issue. There are plenty of studies in which physicists, expecting to find that the universe is made of particle matter, find just that. While on the other side, those expecting to find waves of energy find that. This is called wave-particle duality. Einstein, the father of quantum physics, wrote, quote, It seems as though we must use sometimes the one theory and sometimes the other, while at times we may use either. We are faced with a new kind of difficulty. We have two contradictory pictures of reality. Separately, neither of them fully explains the phenomenon of light. But together they do. End quote. I think that guy might have been on to something. Perhaps we should keep more open minds about some of these things. We might just be in our own way. Next, we'll hear from Morgan Knutson. And after her segment, we go on to talk with Dr. Joseph Gallenberger. Gallenberger is a clinical psychologist with 30 years experience. He is in demand internationally as a psychokinesis and manifestation workshop provider. Here's Morgan. This is probably one of the biggest life lessons the paranormal has to teach us. And I promise you, if you figure this one out for yourself, it will change your life. I'm not kidding. And I'm not making exaggerations. This is a big one because it's the universal law most people get wrong. And it's the principles behind everything you are creating in your life experience. Yeah, it's that big. Things don't come to you. They come through you. There is a fundamental misunderstanding about the laws of the universe. And it's the idea that things are just randomly floating around outside of ourselves. And we are at the mercy of whatever circumstances drop in our lap. We think we've got nothing to do with it. Everything just happens. And we're victims of other people, other places, and of our parents. I'm here to tell you, stuff doesn't come to you. It comes through you. That puts it in the hands of someone else if we're stuck in the idea that it only comes to us. It comes through us. Everything you have, everything you want, everything you dream of already exists in a myriad of probabilities. Now, whether or not you'll access those probabilities and line up to the frequency of what you really want so you can receive it is another thing. However, it doesn't change the fact that everything we have want and are able to be is already available to us. So why don't we all have everything we want? Let me tell you, the universe is unlimited. It is absolutely unequivocally unlimited. We can't get our little egos around the multitude of probabilities available to us that will get us what we want in life. We're not built for that type of conceptualization. However, there is one big factor that usually stops us from going after our potential and what we really want. Stress. We start to feel stress and we take that as a sign from the universe that it just wasn't meant to be, or we find ourselves uncomfortable and think that it must be because we can't hack it. Let me give you a clue into the realm of human emotion, stress included. Sometimes we need the stressors to put us under enough pressure to get our chemistry to change it into diamonds. We take for granted how powerful our minds are, and nowhere highlights this better than parapsychology. If you were anything like me, you were taught growing up that our brain is finite. It's the sum of whatever information we put into it and nothing else. It has a limited potential and can only do what we teach it to do. 
We were also taught our brain and all that information that resides in our skull. It cannot leave those synapses and chemicals. It's a stationary organ that only functioned the way the books told us it functioned. And once the brain was dead, well, that was it for us. We've come a long way since those days, thankfully. But most of us still have a cap on what we believe the brain is capable of doing or manifesting. And because of that, we often neglect its use. There is perhaps no better demonstration of our own power in the realm and study of a phenomenon called psychokinesis. PK research covers a wide range of apparent psi phenomena, including poltergeist activity and the movement of objects, to influence on biological systems, from enzymes to human physiology, and even reactions in non-living systems, such as the behavior of tumbling dice and random number generators. Now, that all sounds real technical, but let me give you the Coles Notes version. It is the ability of our focused thoughts to change the outcomes, probabilities, and experiences of all which is around you. We're not just talking about bending spoons. We're talking about focusing what you want from a probable outcome into physical reality. I told you at the beginning, this lesson had the potential to change your life. And I'm not kidding. Now, what's interesting about PK is that it factors in something those other paranormal events, such as seeing apparitions or remote viewing or even channeling, doesn't. Stress. While most other paranormal occurrences are documented when minds are wandering or in meditation, PK is not only documented during times of celebration and joy, but also during times of frustration and psychological pressure. In short, it takes a range of emotional states in order to get any results at all. In fact, without stressors, PK may have gone somewhat unnoticed because the majority of psychokinetic events in haunting scenarios are fueled by some kind of psychological stress, such as poor family dynamic, a recurring upsetting event, or a job. The bottom line is, psychokinesis happens under pressure. Stress can make you move worlds, and you have a mind that can move objects without touching them. What are you doing with it? In the 1970s, through a survey of 116 poltergeist cases reported between 1612 and 1974, Dr. William Roll, a well-known parapsychologist, made a fascinating discovery. He found that the phenomenon in 92 cases, 79% of them, seemed to be associated with a particular individual or two individuals in certain instances. Similarly, in a 1989 survey of 54 German poltergeist cases, two scientists found that 63% were linked to a living person. Realizing what they had discovered, he and a fellow parapsychologist, J. Gaither Pratt, proposed that much of this phenomenon wasn't disembodied spirits at all, but rather created by a living agent a living person. In 1958, William Roll and Pratt coined the term recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis, or RSPK, as an alternate means of conceptualizing poltergeist phenomenon. William George Roll Jr. was born July 3, 1926, in Bremen, Germany, to his father, a vice consul to Germany and his Danish mother. They divorced when he was three, and already his journey was becoming a rocky one. William went with his mother to Copenhagen, and his father went off to war, where eventually tragedy hit a second time. His mother sadly passed away very suddenly, and William's life was turned upside down yet again as he was passed to the care of a guardian. Anyone who has lost a parent, especially at a young age, can understand the level of stress someone so young had to endure at the passing of his mother while already feeling emotionally homeless because of the divorce and separation of his parents early on. Anyone who hasn't experienced that loss can surely empathize with a child going through such extreme pressure. It was during this time in his life, however, when the pressure began to pull something from young William that he felt he would not otherwise have experienced. He began having out-of-body experiences, 
where he felt his consciousness leaving his body entirely and floating elsewhere in the room. He ended up confiding in his neighbor, who had a keen interest in parapsychology and loaned him books on the subject, which he soon found he could put down. Stress will bring things out of you that you didn't know you had in you. Without the pressure, finding those pressurized diamonds would be impossible. Sometimes it takes stress to form the experiences you need to find the gifts you have, or in both the case of William Rowell and other investigators such as Maurice Gross, discover the next steps into something bigger that you've got on your current map. William was used to a life of high stress, so it wasn't a leap when in 1944, Roll joined the Danish resistance and worked as a courier for nine months before the country's liberation the following year. It was then he successfully reunited with his father, who had come to work with General Eisenhower in attempts to restore the U.S. embassies in Scandinavia. When he returned to America, he enrolled at the University of Berkeley in California and began his studies in psychology, sociology, and philosophy. But his heart had long ago found parapsychology, and he persuaded H.H. H. Price, a professor of logic at Oxford, to take him on as a student. William knew he had found his calling and began work immediately, running the Oxford University Society for Psychical Research, which brought him into connection with the leading British psi researchers. As we have seen and spoken about in other podcasts, when you lead with your instinct, you'll attract those who know it, and that is exactly what happened with William. He soon transferred to Duke University under the watchful eye of J.B. Ryan until Ryan's retirement in 1964. While working with J.B. Ryan, he investigated a plethora of poltergeist cases, including the famous Seaford Poltergeist, which was later turned into the Toby Hooper film Poltergeist. Along with Pratt, Roll made a visit to the house of James and Lucille Herman in Seaford, Long Island in New York State, unsure of what to expect. The couple believed that they were in conflict with their son, 12-year-old Jimmy, who initially believed was throwing objects and being a general terror around the house as Jimmy's pl proclamations of objects moving on their own only seemed to happen when Jimmy himself was in the room. That opinion changed, however, when police officers were called to the scene, felt that the objects were being thrown too far for it to have been their son, and the couple began leaving out bottles of holy water to dispel what they felt was an evil spirit. These would spill in an unexplained manner with sounds that mimicked an explosion. Roll and Pratt tried to imitate and recreate the explosions with bottles and dry ice, but when one exploded when no one was in the room, they began to realize it wasn't being hoaxed. By the end of an extensive investigation, they concluded that the disturbances were indeed being caused by Jimmy, but not in the way the parents initially thought. The investigators concluded that this was a case of psychokinesis, and Jimmy was inadvertently creating the phenomenon from the inside out. This was the beginning of a lifelong journey into the RSPK phenomenon, and being a scientist, William wanted to know how it worked, not just observe things that looked interesting. Others began joining in as well. Another parapsychologist had theorized that gravity and inertia may not affect an object if an RSPK agent, the person creating the activity itself, can affect zero-point energy, which is a sea of random electromagnetic fluctuation through space. Realizing that spatial distance was a factor in this phenomenon, William, along with co-authors D. Burdick and W. T. Joins, analyzed this decline and determined that its properties did indeed make sense with the zero-point energy theory. William began to theorize that psychokinetic waves emanating from the individual and motivated by emotions related to the objects were first connecting to emotional energy imprints on objects themselves, then reduced their weight through zero-point energy and finally would move them. Sounds too sciencey? Well, in short, emotionally charged thoughts become things and can influence our physical reality. What you feel is not just in your head or in your imagination. You change your environment through your perception and your emotion. 
good or bad. Life comes through you, not to you. William conducted surveys and found that 92 poltergeist cases where a likely agent or person creating the manifestations was identified, in 41% of cases, the phenomenon coincided with changes or family problems. Disruptive manifestations were easier to spot. Things like objects being thrown and other bothersome incidents seemed to mimic the energy of the emotions generating them, and they stuck out like a sore thumb. William began to realize just how important psychological testing had to be in parapsychology research and that people were intrinsically intertwined with what they are experiencing, not just within paranormal activity, but in life experiences in general. The universe is a mirror and reflects back to us the emotions that we predominantly reside in. William went on to note, the red thread running through most of the cases I've investigated or am familiar with, is tension in family situations or extensions of them. In general, we find hostility in the agent which cannot be expressed in normal ways, the main target for the anger being the people with whom he or she is associated on a daily basis. Parapsychologist Scott Rogo agreed with this theory and then took it one step further, realizing that this wasn't the issue of an individual but of a dynamic in the house or the business itself. Feelings of hostility, frustration, etc. were common among the entire family. Unfortunately, there was no real method of working off these feelings normally and no one to strike out at. Unconsciously, a poltergeist was created to relieve the tensions and symbolically to attack the house that they wanted to leave. It is not odd, then, that after the family had fully accepted this matter and put it into words, accepting it as the cause of the phenomenon, the disturbances completely ceased. What we think, what we feel, and what we tell ourselves manifests. Sometimes we simply don't realize that until the contrast of a negative situation or experience comes along, and then it shows us just that, William began to take his research outside family homes and into businesses as well, where he found the same results again and again. People who were miserable in their jobs, projecting unhappiness, feeling frustrated, and who generally resided in a place of negative, unhealed emotion were manifesting experiences that mirrored and often created more of the same emotion, fear, frustration, and upset. Contrast can birth discoveries, and sometimes it can uncover the gifts and abilities that you wouldn't otherwise notice. When William shifted his attention to children, the results became that much clearer. Kids who came from what many would consider a broken home, or who were in welfare or foster care, as well as kids who were feeling anger, frustration, or hurt that was left unchecked, exhibited these experiences and abilities as well. William's survey and a study indicated that this kind of situation was present often in many of the 116 poltergeist cases. A third involved children under the age of 19 who were living away from home at the time of the explosion of activity. So what happened when all of this negativity and contrast was cleaned up? Dr. Roll explained, destructive only when the agents were in the company of individuals who seemed to be aroused their anger by abuse, confinement, demands, and other aversive activities. But when the social environment became supportive, the non-local behavior, the poltergeist phenomenon, occurred without destruction of property. From a psychoanalytic perspective, the destructive incidents could be considered symptoms of a parapsychopathology, as suggested by Ryan. But when attended by investigators who treat the agent with kindness and respect, the occurrences make a serve as a positive mechanism to obtain attention and for the researcher to learn more about non-local behavior. In short, your emotions create. You are a creator from the very core of your being and not just with negative experiences. Throughout the 20 years I have been a researcher and investigator, the same has proven true for clients who have come to me with wonderfully positive creations and manifestations as well. 
The better it gets, the better it gets, as they say. But the filters and emotions we fail to deal with and heal seem to greatly affect physical and mental health, as well as the results we create in our day-to-day -day experience. Sometimes it is the beliefs or story that we hold that dictate the results in our lives in ways that our filters prevent us from seeing. What filter does well-being have to pour through to express itself through you? Your emotions and beliefs are doing one of two things, hindering or helping. They are either in the way of what you want or they are aiding in what you want. The great thing about negative emotion is that the lessons born from it are irreplaceable. We have an instinct to move towards joy and when we aren't feeling it, we get angry. We know that that's not our genuine state just as Dr. Eben Alexander discovered with the girl on the butterfly wing during his near-death experience. But whether we see that negative emotion as an indicator and get stuck there or allow it to manifest outwards is another story. What is the contrast here to tell you? What are you giving birth to that you aren't flying with? Every subject is two subjects, the wanted and the unwanted. Where are you predominantly thinking? Next up, we'll hear our interview with Dr. Joseph Gallenberger. He's a senior trainer at the Monroe Institute and created its highly successful MC Squared program. He developed Sync Creation, a home study course in manifestation, and has taught over 70 Inner Vegas adventure workshops. His book, Inner Vegas, Creating Miracles, Abundance, and Health, receives rave reviews. Liquid Luck, his other book, is also available as a binaural beat CD. Here's our interview with Dr. Joseph Gallenberger. Well, I think we should crack into this because, as I say, I, I'm a, a big fan of, of your work and the work at the Monroe Institute. And recently we just spoke to uh, Alan Evans and we were talking about manifestation and all of, of the, the, the magic of, of what you guys do and, and teaching other people. And it, it to me, it's just, it's phenomenal. And, and Mike and I have, have been a, a, a follower and, uh, uh, you know, have worked worked in our own way with with things like manifestation but you were a you you're a clinical psychologist you've got 30 years of experience behind you as as a therapist and in 92 you started your work in psychokinesis what was the 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 overlap for you where where did you and, and why did you get started with that and i um had out of body experiences and things like that as a kid and reading Bob Monroe's books, I was interested. And uh, when I found out that there was an institute, you could go and learn uh, what he had been uh, experiencing. So I went up there and uh, very quickly saw that the brainwave technology they used at the time called Hemisync was, uh, had lots of clinical applications. So I brought back uh, exercises where somebody could enter into a deep meditative state within 10 minutes or so, and then use that state for reducing anxiety or creativity, reducing depression, things like that that were helpful in my clinical practice. And I also got all fired up about being a trainer up there and got accepted. So I've been a trainer there for 30 plus years now. And um, they dovetailed well. So I would uh, have my clinical practice, but about 10 weeks a year, I'd go up to Monroe to teach uh, one of their programs up at the Institute. And uh, pretty quickly that developed into, uh, boy, you can get in touch with spirit and all those great energies um, and fly out of body, but how could you use it here in the physical? And so that brought into the, the work into energy healing, manifestation and psychokinesis. That makes sense. And it, what I've found over the years is, you know, I've been in the in the field for about 20 years myself. And what I've found is that there really is no separation between that, the non-physical world and, and us and our communication with it. And I love the fact that you're bringing in this, you know, the, these aspects into, into your practice, because I think it's something that is so important for, for people to really, to, to really be able to get their, their heads around. 
And you were training yourself to use psychokinesis and whatnot as well. Can you talk yeah, a little so, bit about that? Uh, just in case folks aren't too familiar, telekinesis and psychokinesis are referring to the same events. And that's affecting physical matter reality. The way I would look at it would be uh, your mind is like the steering wheel of a car. It sets a direction or the intent. And then you move uh, that intent through the energy of an open heart is the most positive way to do it. Uh, and you use your energy then to affect the physical. So we've had people grow seeds in their hand with an inch and a half root growth in about two minutes. Uh, lighting light bulbs where they've measured 400 volts off our hands as we're projecting that energy to light the light bulb. Bending metal, uh, these are the heaviest Oneida stainless steel wear into uh, pretty fancy shapes. Um, rolling dice in patterns, affecting slot machines, um, and energy healing, you're affecting uh, systems within the body usually. Uh, also to, to change those. So we've had some dramatic results that way. And the nice thing about using psychokinesis is, is it's very studyable in a laboratory. We know the statistics, for example, of how dice should throw randomly, uh, how often a slot machine should hit. And so if you can beat chance, you can do that to a significant event, studyable. Um, so for example, some experiments I did, uh, at PEAR, Princeton Engineering Anomalous Research at Princeton University, we had results of 30,000 to one by chance, where at uh, 100 to one by chance, you know, a drug is considered effective and is released to the public. So um, we're getting strong effects there. Uh, and I love the state. It's uh, your hands usually for most people feel warm. Some people get ice cold. Uh, energy of a wide open heart uh, feeling connected to earth and to spirit. And so it's a very joyous state. And within that, um, you know, you can roll nine nines on the dice or uh, I like to get uh, royal flush and, and hearts on slot machines. That's a 160,000 to one by chance. And I've gotten it on the first poll more than once. Um, and studying the lab uh, is kind of boring though. You know, they have to do 100 trials, 48 seconds each on and off. You might have 128 lead EEG on your head, which takes an hour to put on all those pins. Um, and um, you're not getting too much feedback. Um, so Vegas came to mind as a place where if you did this well, you get rewarded with money, which is pretty exciting. So I uh, started out there. 20 plus years ago, and I've done 99 inner Vegas adventure workshops with groups of 18. And uh, we had people have uh, become pain free from post polio syndrome uh, overnight in the workshop for the first time in 20 years. Lots of healings like that, manifesting, art commissions, selling of houses, soulmates. And that generated some books. I wrote Inner Vegas, Creating Miracles of Abundance at House first. And then I wanted to summarize these three decades of experience into giving somebody a taste in about a half hour. So I put out a meditation called Liquid Luck that you're familiar with, Morgan. And, uh, and that was so successful with people winning lottos three weeks in a row, $1,000 tickets on scratch, and uh, selling houses that have been on the market for long periods of time in the next day. So I wrote a book called Liquid Luck, the Good Fortune Handbook. And uh, in Liquid Luck, we, we emphasize, you could call them spiritual, but they're really positive psychology aspects such as happiness, feeling grateful, feeling abundant, feeling uh, compassionate, feeling fortunate into a imaginary liquid that you drink whenever you wanna have a lucky day. And it's been quite successful. So uh, I get stories around the world each week of that working for people. And uh, so that's been my path in a, in a shorthand there. Uh, it's, it's brilliant. And, and I love, I, I love the, 
the the fact that you really bring in uh, the idea of of joy and whatnot with this as well because I know I, for Mike and I that's the one thing that we've found as well where um, that without that level of joy it it really doesn't have the the same effect and for me because my, so much of my background's in in parapsychology even um, uh, it, scientists such as like Dr. William Roll or uh, Dr. Scott Rogo, when they were looking at, at psychokinesis, and that's what they were finding too, is that there was this very strong connection to emotion. And the more emotion that, w you know, you're putting into something either on one side or the other, the more chance almost you, you get of, of something, of something actually manifesting. How have you found that psychokinesis and manifestation really relate to one another because I think that's something that people don't really connect as as one in the yes. same thing so mainly uh, they when you experience them yourself you begin to see them as variants of the same energy um, but what happens in psychokinesis that's very favorable for example if we're at the dice table and we're of feeling one with the universe, grounded to beautiful Mother Earth, connected with spirit and all that good stuff. We get rewarded with money within seconds. And if we go into greed, fear, ego, the money's withdrawn within seconds. So it's a very quick feedback. Where in manifestation work, you could think positive for weeks and your soulmate may not show up yet because it might take a year. You could think negatively for weeks and eventually get a cold and not even link up your physical illness to the fact that you've been negatively thinking. Um, so when we look at things in manifestation, like this, the movie, The Secret, where they say visualize, that's terrific. But if you then don't have the energy and you don't have the belief system open to it's possible, uh, it's very challenging. So most of my work is really working in more of the shadow, the, the limits people have um, in our culture, there's things like nothing good comes easy, no pain, no gain. Then healing has a hard time being instant or an instant manifestation. Um, so we do a lot of getting rid of um, guilt and lack and fear being the main thing. I have a saying on my wall, fear is expensive, love is priceless, choose wisely. Because usually what's dampening the field of energy is fear in some form. And uh, then after clearing that, then building up real strong energy through these meditative techniques that we use at Monroe Institute and that I use in my own, own workshops and, and on my uh, meditation CDs and downloads. So um, when you do that, you know, you say to somebody, well, meditate and you'll clear your mind great, but it could take 10 years to learn how to do that. So the Western technologies now where it can take 10 minutes to quiet the mind, really um, make this thing go forward more easily. But the main way um, that manifestation and PK are related is PK you could look at as a speeded up version of manifestation, bringing something into incarnation within seconds of building the energy, where in manifestation it may take longer. Sometimes it doesn't, but um, uh, that's how they relate. Is that pretty clear? Yeah, I think that's perfect. And because I think that's something that the audience, and or at least that, that a lot of people that that step into the idea of manifestation, because you, like you were saying, the, the secret, I think a lot of people were introduced to this idea through films like that and whatnot, but there were pieces that were missing. And I love how what what you're doing here is is really addressing some of those missing pieces where people are going, well, you know, well, how do I know it's showing up? Well, how do I know this is this is happening? Well, there are ways to actually to to take a look at this and I love uh, your how you talk about how mind energized by the heart influences our reality, which is is something that that I've found as well, especially in in parapsychology, um, which I think is again is something that people aren't entirely familiar with uh, when it comes to to 
creating the the world around us that we are really interconnected um and the what we put out there in terms of our our state of being you know it doesn't really necessarily matter whether you're a, a good person what people consider a good person or a bad person but it really is a, a state of being yeah and usually being a good person and defined as loving open-hearted compassionate generous that tends to create a positive cycle of energy and that tends to be self-sustaining. You smile at somebody and they smile at you. Um, so that is there. But when people start in manifesting, you know, one of the key things is there, we find in psychokinesis literature is it's much more likely if you believe it's possible and that you have then confidence you can do it. And in manifesting work, um, where we don't teach it much in high school or grade school, so when somebody says, well, I'm going to manifest a better job or soulmate or whatever it is, or better health, they're, they're missing the knowingness, the strong, strong confidence. And so if you can say to somebody, here's a metal object, try by force to bend it, and there's no way they can do it by force, they try, and then it melts like butter in front of their eyes, or let's roll nine nines in a row or flip coins and come up 20 times in a row heads, then they get an idea that maybe it's possible, maybe they can do it, and maybe it's not of the devil. Uh, maybe it's one of our natural things. I often say, Morgan, that PK is impossible till it's easy, uh, psychokinesis, and it's a natural thing, but being natural doesn't necessarily make, make it go well. If yeah. If uh, if you wanted to go to sleep tonight, you'd probably be tired. So that's your motivation. And then you'd think you'd have a small intention. Gee, I'd like to go to sleep. And then you'd think of something else. You'd let go. But if I put you on TV uh, saying, I'll give you $10 million if you can fall asleep in the next half hour why why uh, millions of people watch you on TV, you probably couldn't. <laughs> yeah. So sleep is natural, but it, you can put in efforting self-consciousness, those kind of things, and, and make it impossible. Um, dancing, the zone in sports, a lot of things you can overthink. And most people, when they approach manifestation, they're overthinking it. And that, that impairs the energy, much like the naturalness of sleep, the naturalness of PK goes away. So that's why, in fact, kids do much easier time on this than, than adults usually. Because they, you tell them it's possible, they believe it. And then their energy is naturally more ebullient and flowing better. And they can have that wide open hope of, of a child before a birthday for the gift that they want. They can apply that wide open hope to the spoon bending or that this thing will manifest. Um, so it's, it's kind of um, a nice bridge. And to me, bridging science and spirit is what we read, need right now as a culture. There's way too much fear forms going, you know, and, and fear creates the, is a prayer for what you don't want. And so um, if we can help people understand that what they think and what they put their positive energies to can have terrific effects quickly, uh, that's where I think we can put some, the brakes on some of the negative patterns in the world and create some positive stuff. So, you know, we have reports of uh, going through programs that I teach. One guy, his family had large farms in the Midwest and he could raise the nitrogen content in the soil by his thought and his energy. Imagine the world with no need for nitrogen fertilizers, how much less pollution there would be, how much cheaper food would be. Um, so we can apply these things to larger problems than just bending, bending a spoon or something. I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I, this is exactly the conversation that I need to have right now. Uh, I've been struggling personally with a few things around my health. One of those is weight. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have this kind of, I have a goal that I would like to reach, yes. uh, but I've, I've hit this sort of plateau and I've been there for probably about a year and I just keep obsessing 
uh, about getting to this place and I'm frustrated that I haven't passed this one particular uh, place and uh yes and ha- like how do you how do you overcome these humps when when you when you come across when you come up against a bias yeah. like I'm pretty certain that I have some sort of bias some sort of non-belief how do you deal with that how do you help somebody to overcome that well first be being aware that it's probably an internal limit mm-hmm. We've done some of these meditation CDs for, we did one for golf, for example, and people started driving, you know, 250 yards and beautiful drives. And then they would seven putt because their belief system was that they were an 80s golfer, a hundred golfer, had a fella caught for a couple of years, I think at 11 miles, who was a marathon runner. <clears throat> he listened to one called Lightfoot and ran 22 miles the next day. So you can burst through these. Um, In my meditations, uh, the one called the healing heart, it's designed to say healing into your full potential body, mind, and spirit. So using the meditative technique, you can drop the issues of fear and the the ego patterns of thought, um, and they can be formidable. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there was a guy... He wanted a job and, and he wasn't having much luck and said, well, what would you really like? He said, well, I think I'd like a job two months a year in pretty weather with pretty girls around. And I said, well, put that out in meditation. A guy from high school called him, sold him his business, which was an advertising boat at the beach. <laughs> and the season was two months long. Girl in a bikini would drive the, the boat so people would pay attention Coke or a local restaurant would have ads on the boat side. By the end of the year, he had three boats and a Lexus and the season was two months long. But for most people, as soon as you say job equals two months, they're out of there. That doesn't align with their belief system. So um, coaching is often good, Mike, um, to see if there are family patterns, um, societal patterns, other things that might hold the weight, that there are reasons for it. Um, that might guard against uh, various issues emotionally. But when you get some insight into that, usually then by raising the energy, um, if it's appropriate, these barriers can f- melt and, uh, and then person can make progress. And again, that confidence issue comes up so that, you know, might be, dang, I can bend the spoon, so I guess I can lose another five. Well, I have had a lot of success in regard to other air in other areas of my life in that way. Uh, and it, it's weird that, okay, here I've come up against something now that I, I can't seem to <laughs> overcome. Yeah. And, you know, have a lot of compassion yourself and, and humility. Some of us have come here to clear patterns that are multi-generational. Um, and so, you know, my, my wife's parents were Russian born, bad things in World War II, lost their families, met as refugees in Austria. There's some heavy energies there that I think she came to help clear. So um, there can be that type of deal and loyalty to family and tribe, um, past experience with you know, you might have seen a 98-pound weakling. That's what it used to be the phrase in the 50s in the ad of muscle building. You might have seen a person like that get bullied in high school or, or grade school. That can stick in you. Um, and so we're wanting to create an openness in meditation where ego is quieted. And then we say, is it appropriate for me to lose more weight now or to be such a, a weight? Um, that is your goal, you get a yes or a no. If you got a um, yes, um, then you might ask for pictures that would show you or knowings um, or even songs that might come through that have messages that would lead you on discovery about what might be holding this there. The biggest thing you can do in error would be to decide you're not deserving or not talented enough. Neither of those I ever see to be true. <laughs> and, and yet it's more some elegant expression of many different things coming together 
that results in something. So it's the same way for me, Mike. You know, I can heal a cat scratch in 20 minutes, uh, but I still wear glasses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's certain things that tend to be there. Um, and we have to be sensitive that there may be some mm -hmm. dynamic reasons. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of times I see people when they have a goal, say, of weight, and they really put this out in the high meditative states, they find themselves do doing weird things to them, meeting new people and talking to them that they'd usually just pass them and maybe smile. And those people turn out to be great partners to walk with every morning. Um, they get a pet, the, the, a dog that they have to walk or something, and they're not thinking weight when this happens. Right. But they may find that they're eating much higher quality foods, exercising more, um, you know, different patterns in their life begin to rearrange rather than just watching how many calories are put in the body. Yeah, I think there's that aspect of it that that you know everybody everybody can think that it's going to come through this certain way and and i think that's where some people really get narrow minded when it comes to this stuff where it's like they have this image that it's going to happen in a in a very specific way and they see all of this other stuff changing and they're going well wait a minute like you know this doesn't have anything to do with you know whether it be weight or a job or or something like that and it, you know, the universe has a way of of reorchestrating things to at least what i've found to get around those limiting beliefs mm -hmm. yeah so it's a you're you're um when it's something to me you know i know it's hard to look at it this way mike but when you get a block that's the time you go ah interesting now i can really begin to participate in an, a new adventure in my own consciousness of discovery um, because it can lead you um, into things where the weight is the cherry on top of the Sunday, um, but that you learn all these other things along the way. Um, that tends to get further than this is the real pain in the neck <laughs> or uh, fear that if I keep going this way, I'm going to have a heart attack at 40 like my dad did or whatever it would be. You know, the people will carry fear forms. But um, if you can look at this as, uh, <clears throat> boy, this is really interesting. Yeah. I, I have luck in other areas. I know yeah. I'm a nice guy. I got the energy. I got the intelligence. Uh, we're playing life at a, a three-dimensional chess level here. Let's see what's, what's up. You've really given me some ideas in this discussion, uh, especially because I have had, like I say, a lot of success in other areas of my life. Good. Doing just these things and, and watching the universe set things up in my favor over and over and over again. So I think this is just another opportunity for me and mm -hmm. probably the reason why that you're here with us today for me anyway. <laughs> Yeah, I found too that my and this this has just been something I've come across recently when it comes to 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 manifesting things is that my my own personal definition of letting go was not enough of letting go. Yeah. <laughs> Very recently and it was it's funny because it's only been in the last I would say month I I've been doing a, a very deep dive into some of uh Neville Goddard's uh work and techniques and stuff as well and it was it was interesting because i i really discovered that what i thought was you know okay i've let this go you know i've i've you know put good intention out there and whatnot i really wasn't i i wasn't letting go near to the degree that I, that i thought i was so i've had to really check myself in that department and go wait a minute like you know what you is is the definition that i have of letting go is is that enough or is that right and and that was a big aha for me because I didn't, I really thought I, you know, I had, uh, you know, I had this in the bag and, and whatnot. You know, the tough part is the stronger than desire for something like, you know, I don't want this lump under my arm to be something bad. Um, the stronger the desire, the more fear it generates mm -hmm. and uh, it makes the letting go part of challenge. I use this definition of letting go. I say to myself, 
all I'm letting go of when I surrender is the illusion of separateness. Oh, yeah. And that that helps me um, fall into a place where I'm more in line with the, the oneness of things. Um, there was a fellow, he was working random number generator, and, and uh, he wrote a book recently called The Selection Effect. And when he got to the equivalent of, roll, of flipping 15 to- coins heads and 15 times in a row, um, he would be aware that he was afraid that the next one would be a failure, but he was always a- also afraid that it would be a success. And, mm. and that, when you both fear failure and success, um, that tends to be where it really gets stuck. So even on yeah. something like weight, at an unconscious level, we can f- fear tremendous success because it's life changing. Uh, people come to my workshops and say, I'm afraid I won't be able, I'll be the only one not able to bend the spoon. And then when we dig deeper, they're afraid that they will be able to because it'll change their belief system. So often when we're having trouble letting go, it's because it's not just, right. okay, I wanted a good job. I put that out there. I put my resume. Now I got to let go. We're also letting go of some belief system that's linked into our self-concept. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. This is exactly what happened to me with career. Yeah. I, I used to struggle and think, uh, I'm just going to fail. So why bother trying? And Mm -hmm. if I took a run at something, I always took a run at it with the wrong sort of motive and the wrong idea in mind and all that kind of stuff. And then when I was finally able to sort of really have a look at what my ideas about myself and, uh, in relation to the world and success uh, and take some risks, holy smokes, things started to change. But the reason they wouldn't is because I was terrified that I had been wrong about myself for all these years. Wow. Yeah. So again, lots of compassion to me, you know, uh, when I talk about my inner Vegas adventure workshops, uh, most people go, Oh, I don't gamble. And I think to myself, gee, you came to this planet, you got married, you had kids, you were a high <laughs> roller. We live in a state where we're having to make decisions with high risk. You know, my when my daughter asked to go to a party, I could say yes or no. Either way, it could be very harmful to her. And I don't know the real answer. Um, and then I have to live not only with the consequences of my decision on me, but on the people I love the most. So it, it takes tremendous courage to be a human being. It let, you know, just to survive, let alone to branch out in a new area, like a new career or body image or, or things like that. So we should all pat each, ourselves on the back for having the courage to be here. It's like driving a Ferrari with our eyes closed. Mm. We, uh, <clears throat> we have lots of power, uh, but we can't see the future. <laughs> of our and consequences of our decisions fully yeah so um you know when i say fear is expensive love is priceless choose wisely it's easier said than done it it is yeah but there are ways now yeah and and the more like you were saying earlier about about this being so needed in in today's culture and i I couldn't agree with you more and we mike and i've talked about that before as well where you know, I think we are so in a a, a culture right now of, of disempowerment and no matter where people are, are, are looking, you know, it just seems like there there's so many opportunities for people to either get sucked into into fear or negativity and, and things like that. And and it's so important now, I think, for people to to have that that power put back in their own hands and the wonderful thing about this is that not only does it allow people to to bring a sense of of empowerment back into their experience but also to find and reconnect with with that joy with that that eternal spirit and whatnot which is one of the reasons why i really love your your sync creation as well um can you talk a little bit about that and what made you want to give this tool to people at home that that can't make it to say the Monroe Institute or something like that? Yeah. So, right. So 
the home study course on manifestation that also uses these PK tasks as feedback, as we've mentioned, has a lot about energy healing. It's called S Sync, S Y N C, and then the word for hemisync or synchronize, and then the word creation, C R E A T I O N. And people can look at syncreation.com to get more info. But basically, um, there's three personal coaching sessions in it with me and uh, lots of meditation exercises to get rid of these blocks, to raise energy and to focus. And one reason I got into this work was I had a brother, Peter, who um, was handsome, hardworking, honest, etc., and really couldn't get it together well in his life. And he committed suicide eventually. And it left me wondering why good people can't manifest better lives sometimes. And it seemed to me that he didn't feel deserving and he also had quite a bit of fear. So that's why those things are emphasized. So the course is designed to help pay at your own rate and rhythm um, with lots of good materials in there to focus on raising these kind of energies, getting into gratitude, getting rid of lack and fear, those kind of things so that you can create what you'd like and using the feedback stuff in PK to build confidence. Yeah. And it's been very well received. I have it on special on my website that I've had on since COVID started because of all the fear that that generates and also all the free time people have at home sometimes. And it's been very, got good re reports of very good success with that. Moving into new ways of earning money, um, new ways of protecting your health that are positive rather than just hiding down the basement, yeah. things like that. So I'm real proud of the course and um, we've been selling it in one form or another for two decades and the results are um, really fabulous. Uh, there's on my website a survey of uh, 60 people taking the course and what they've been able to do and it's things like manifesting adoptions when yeah. it couldn't be before, healing health problems, starting businesses, getting money sent to them unexpectedly, um, anywhere in the financial relationship, health ways. Um, there's a lot of different reports. So if you wanted to go really deeply, that's a good way. Yeah. If you wanted to taste the Liquid Luck book and CD or download or a good way to just taste this and say, is this for me? Um, because the home study course with three uh, coachings with me is not 20 bucks, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. And it, it's just, it's so, it's so worthwhile because I think, you know, any, any time people want to delve into this, it really is an investment in, in the the rest of their life. I mean, it's, it's definitely not a, a fly by night thing. And what, what I've found in, in this journey of, of learning some of this stuff and understanding it is that, it really is once you get into it you can't unsee it and you can't look at the world the same way again you can't go back to thinking the same way because the connections between what you're creating and what is you know what you've got going on within you it becomes so clear that you know you just start seeking out as as many tools as possible to to create mm -hmm. better and to create something that you know you you a life that you really really want to live what what do you think is the biggest misinterpretation or mistake that people have when it comes to manifesting? Quite a few people secretly would say, I don't think this would work, even though they hope it would. Others would say, you know, I don't deserve it. <clears throat> Others will, will come in and say um, something that would say, well, you know, I, I don't have the time there's a lot of yes buts okay uh and i'd say you know it's totally fine to start so, uh, small mm -hmm. and to ask for signs that this is workable and say a person wanted money right some some of us find that handy um just a few and they put that out and the first time they hear the word starbucks this is a true story of my life i had a glowing feeling and I called my broker and he didn't never hadn't never heard of the company. This is way back. He looked it up and said, Oh, they're gonna start coffee shops. Don't invest in that. That'll never go anywhere. Well, <laughs> it did go somewhere. So I can say, hmm, 
I had this thought I'd like a better financial flow. And then my intuition served me and came up with an idea. Uh, now we know, uh, you know, we have teenagers who get a good idea on Friday and by the end, Monday, they're millionaires. Right. <laughs> when you uh, want to put something out, not only for yourself, but for the benefit of the world and other people, the universe tends to cooperate with that. But you can start small. I like, I don't like diving off cliffs. I'm a little bit afraid of heights, let's say. <laughs> and so I move like an amoeba. You put out a pseudopod, uh, a foot of protoplasm in a new area, like starting a business on the side. Right. And if it's receptive, you flow more of your life energy or protoplasm in that direction. And then you could flow it backwards if it doesn't work so well. So you don't have to, you know, put it all on the line every time. Um, but you can say, I'm going to start an interesting experiment. And, um, and one of my uh, daughters found in COVID, she liked to knit. It took away some of the stress, crochet, I should say. And she started these crochet animals. They sell for, I don't know, 200 bucks a pop. And just in her, short, in her spare time, she does that. So it's a little thing on the side. Someone else will start an Airbnb or whatever. So don't make it have to be all or none. I would say, you know, in manifestation, maybe that's the biggest error. You know, I got to change my whole life around like I joined a new religion called manifestation before I have proof that it works. And that's going to be tough. So start small. Yeah, I love that. I, I think I think that's really great advice because, uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I think especially as as you delve into this stuff as deliberate creators there can be a tendency to feel pressure like you know i've i've i can i can do this i want to show myself i can do this and it's got to be these you know great big giant results or you know people aren't going to believe that you know that it's real or that you know i can really do this or i'm i'm afraid of looking you know like i'm 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 crazy or whichever and as soon as you do that you're just you're swimming right back upstream and and so i think i love the advice of of just being able to you know start start small and and maybe thrive quietly <laughs> at the beginning yes yeah, so so things like the thing creation home study you know you get the seeds and they grow in your hand you'll be impressed yeah. Even if initially the seeds you quote send energy to over two days, you notice any difference, no difference, but the third day they're twice as big as the ones you didn't. Um, and, um, you know, rolling nine nines in a row on the dice or whatever it would be, everybody's got their own way of doing things. A lot of people get excited about lighting a light bulb. Um, then you have some confidence building tools. And that's where that comes in handy. Yeah. And to not forget about the joy aspect of it. I, I think that's that's yeah. really one of the the biggest keys that that I've I've found over the over this this journey is that people tend to just forget about the joy or the the level of happiness or contentment that they think they have. They really don't. You know, I've I've met a lot of people over the years, and I'm I'm sure you guys have as well, where you know they'll they'll immediately tell you, oh no no I'm happy I'm happy it's fine and really they're not at all they, they've got sort of the happy face sticker over the empty gas gauge and they're they're just plowing along and they've they've left that that aspect out or you know they're not accustomed to to that joy and the wonderful thing about this material that and i, I mike i think you you found this too is that it really does bring bring a level of of happiness and self-satisfaction that there's that not much else does for me. I don't know. Yes. So, you know, it's it's tough. Say you've been out of work six months. You're about to lose your house. you got three kids to feed, yeah. right? How are you going to be joyful when you look for a job? Well, you come back to what you do have. You have the love of your children. You have the love and support of your spouse, ideally. You live in an area where you can look at the sky uh, you have freedom in the United States, at least. You have the miracle and beauty of the human hand. You have 50 trillion cells in your body singing the song of life each day in quite good coordination. And you, you build and build on top until you realize how abundant you are, the abundance of books you could read, support you can have through organizations. 
and friends, and you get to a place where you're feeling very abundant, then you begin to put out your resume. Um, but if you start from, oh my God, if one more month I can't find a job, I'm gonna, my kids are gonna starve, then your fear is too yeah. high and you're gonna manifest. I look at it as a barometer or a balance. If you had 10% desire and 90% fear, you're gonna get what you don't want. As they get to 50-50, not much happens. As you get to 60% desire, 40% fear, things come in, but with lots of glitches and efforts and work. As you get to 80% desire and only 20% fear, that's when synchronicity, serendipity, things go your way. Mm -hmm. And 90% desire and 10% fear, there's no stopping you. You don't have to be perfect. You can't, don't have to go to 100%, no fear. But look where you are now and don't even worry about what you're gonna manifest if the fear is greater than the desire. Um, and you know, ask yourself that honestly. And it might be that it's natural and normal to feel fear when, when you're in a financial stress, for example, or a health stress. But work on the thing first to get the desire up and the fear down. Does that make sense? Brilliant. Very much. Yeah, bri brilliant advice. Uh, Joe, thank you so much for, for being here today and, and sharing all of this because I know we're going to post for, for everybody, we're going to post the links to, to your site and the programs and, and Liquid Luck mm -hmm. and all of those um, so that people can can delve into this for themselves and, and start to feel better because it's, it is, I think it is just so important for, for today's society especially. Thank you, Mike and Morgan, for having me on, and uh, and I appreciate you putting stuff up there for people to get in touch. I'd like today to be of help, you know? Yeah, absolutely, and you've helped me a lot, really, more than you probably know. But uh, we'll post a link to sync, S-Y-N-C, creation.com in the show notes. Uh, but if you want to, go now, sync, creation.com. Here's Morgan for this episode's segment of Spiritual Health Care. In this episode's edition of Spiritual Health Care, the segment of the show where you get to be the creator and designer of your paranormal and spiritual experience, we're going to tell you about a process called the Fun Things List. How many times have you been in a place where finding a positive thought feels almost impossible? We've all been there. What often happens is that when we are in negative emotion, we simply don't have access to those good feeling thoughts because we are emotionally out of range. Almost like trying to get from 8.80 a.m. to 95.7 f.m. and expecting to do it in a single bound. You can't get to the new station without gradually going through the other stations first. You have to work your way up the scale. The fun things list is for exactly those moments. When you're in a positive mood, take a piece of paper or write them in your phone and make a list of some core things that genuinely lifts your spirits. Maybe it's describing your pet, a memory you love thinking about, a certain place you love to go, or simple things like everyday moments that have made you smile. Make a list and keep them handy. And the next time you find yourself unable to find a good feeling thought, pull out your list. It doesn't mean you get there immediately, but you can slowly make your way up the emotional scale to a better and happier feeling place over something you love that has less resistance than your current predicament. Getting to a place where you feel less stress opens up the universal doors for solutions, love, ideas, and new opportunities you may not have had access to when you're on a not so fun radio station. Remember, you need nothing to be happy, but you need something to be sad. At the end of seeking, all is consciousness. Stay in peace, everyone. Thank you for listening to this episode of Supernatural Circumstances, a co-production of Entity Seeker Paranormal Research and Teachings and Good Egg Studios. This podcast is part of the Curious Cast Podcast Network. Theme music by Corey Johnson of Catalyst Records in Edmonton, Alberta. You can find out more about Morgan Knudsen at entityseeker.ca and more about me and listen to my other show at darkpatine.com. Feel free to email the show at supernaturalcircumstances at gmail.com. 
Good night for now. <laughs>